I hope this video will give you a clear view about the expression zero to the power of zero. As always, let's start with the most fundamental concepts, integers. Let's say we have three positive integers, a, b, and c. And with them, we can derive the arithmetic laws of exponentiations. a to the power of b means a multiply itself b times. And similarly, a to the power of c means a multiply itself c times. From this definition, we can calculate the value of the fraction a to the power of b over a to the power of c. If b is greater than c, by definition, we get a to the power of b minus c. This notation will remain true even if b is less than c. And if b is c, we are dividing one number by itself, so the result is 1. Following this chain of logic, when a is a positive integer, a to the power of 0 is always 1. Just like this, 4 to the power of 0 is 1, 3 to the power of 0 is 1, 2 to the power of 0 is 1, 1 to the power of 0 is also 1, and it seems that this pattern will continue to give us 0 to the power of 0 is 1. You may think this argument is stupid, but it was Euler who used a similar logic to prove that 0 to the power of 0 is 1. In his book, Introduction to the Analysis of the Infinite 300 years ago, Euler made it very clear that a to the power of 0 is 1, even when a is 0. But the counterargument is very strong. By definition, 0 to the power of b, as long as b is a positive integer, is going to be 0. Just like the argument we made earlier, it seems natural to extend this pattern such that 0 to the power of 0 is 0. Although it is very tricky to think about one number multiplied itself 0 times. In summary, Purely in the context of integer exponentiation, it is really hard to assign an exact value to 0 to the power of 0, and this plants the seed for endless debate online. What does it mean to map from one empty site to another empty site, and why is it related to 0 to the power of 0? Suppose we have two sets. How many ways can we map alpha, beta, and gamma to x and y? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 8 is 2 to the power of 3 because each of alpha, beta, and gamma can choose their image independently. Therefore, it's 2 times 2 times 2, 8. 3 is the number of elements in the domain, and 2 is the number of elements in the codomain. However, when both sides are empty, the definition of function or mapping we learned in pre-calculus course no longer work, because you cannot map nothing to nothing. But the pre-calculus definition of a function is also not formal. Think about that. What does it really mean to assign a value as the output of a function? You cannot formalize the process of assigning. So let's use this example of mapping from A to B to introduce the formal definition of a mapping of function that is based on set theory. A function is a triple, A, B, and F. A is a domain, B is a codomain, and F is a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B, such that for any element in A, there exists one and only one element in B, such that the tuple A and B belongs to F. I know it's much more abstract, but let's look at one example. So the three tuples mapping from AI to BI make up my F and it's clearly a subset of the Cartesian product of A and B. Now, for every element in big A, say small a1, then small a1 and its image b1 together makes up a tuple a1b1, and a1b1 is clearly an element of f, and this is how a function of mapping is defined rigorously using set theory. 
Now let's apply our definition to the empty set case. The Cartesian product of two empty sides is still an empty side, and the only subset of empty side is an empty side. So F is an empty side. We have a unique triple, empty side, empty side, empty side, that defines a function. Just to check this definition, it actually works perfectly. And this one and only one unique empty function is what Professor Knuz refers to. As an analogy that may not be so suitable, this piece of code will run perfectly and the syntax is perfectly legal, but it does absolutely nothing. I actually skipped one example right here. Professor Knuz gave an example. It is the binomial formula. This is a classic example because the binomial formula is so important that it must be true for any x, y, and positive integer n. In this counterexample, if we substitute x and y as 0 and 1, the left-hand side becomes 1, and the right-hand side, starting from the second term, are all 0. There is no doubt. However, the first term, if we expand and choose 0, we get n factorial over 0 factorial n factorial. Houston, are you reading this? It seems that the two most fascinating expressions collide. If 0 factorial is 1, then 0 to the power of 0 is 1. If 0 to the power of 0 is 1, then 0 factorial is 1. This shouldn't be too surprising because there is one way to arrange 0 objects. Just don't arrange. To be frank, I do acknowledge that 0 to the power of 0 is more difficult to understand. Another simple but classic example is given by Herbert Vann in 1970. The geometric sequence. If we set x as 0, on the left-hand side we have 1, but the right-hand side we have 0 to the power of 0 plus a bunch of zeros. Therefore, 0 to the power of 0 must be 1. Those evidences from polynomial manipulations are not coincidence. We will see why in our next chapter. Consider the following two expressions. x is just a symbol, and for simplicity, we think a n and b n are real numbers. We can somewhat think them as generalized or extended polynomials such that the orders can go to infinity. This expression has a name, the formal power series. For folks who are familiar with abstract algebra, you may notice that I already use the ring notation. But still, let's define what a ring is step by step. First, let's define an addition operation. By adding the coefficients term by term, we get a new power series. We can say power series are closed under the addition operation. Similarly, we can define a multiplication operation. The inner sum is called the Cauchy sum. It's like a discrete version of convolution. As complicated as the coefficients may get, they remain real numbers. Therefore, power series will remain closed under the multiplication operation. As a set note, Introducing the formal power series allows us to look at the geometric expansion from another perspective. If p alpha is 1 minus x, and its product with p beta is 1, then we have a system of linear equations, very simple ones, to solve for p beta, which are essentially all ones. If we try to substitute 0, then we recover the conclusion that 0 to the power of 0 must be 1. But not all formal power series has such an inverse. For example, if p alpha is x squared, then you cannot find p beta such that p alpha p beta is 1. Now, even dropping the requirement that every power series will have a multiplicative inverse, the formal power series are good enough to form an abstract structure called a ring. So, what's a ring? A ring is a set on whose elements two operations are defined. Those two operations are often called addition and multiplication. 
In order to be a ring, the addition must be commutative, and the addition must be associative, and we must have addition identity, and addition must be inversible. Also, the multiplication must be associative. We must have multiplicative identity, and we need to have left distributivity and right distributivity. You can verify that our formal power series satisfy all these conditions. Among these eight rules, we are particularly interested in the addition identity and the multiplication identity. So, what is the addition identity? It's just zero, because zero plus any power series is still that power series. And the multiplicative identity or multiplication identity is x to the power of zero. According to the exponentiation rule, multiplying one power series with x to the power of zero doesn't change anything. So far, everything is beautiful and self-consistent. The polynomial ring can be treated as a special or truncated version of the power series ring. If we truncate the power series after a certain order, we get polynomials. You can verify that all those polynomials also form a ring. The good thing about the polynomial ring is that we can introduce an operation called evaluation. We can evaluate the polynomial when x equals a certain number, as a polynomial always has a finite order, different from formal power series. Evaluating a polynomial will always result in a finite real number. For example, when x is two, evaluating this polynomial gives us a real number. The evaluation operation has some good properties. For example, the evaluation of the sum becomes the sum of the evaluations. The evaluation of the product becomes the product of the evaluations. We will see that the evaluation operation creates a homomorphism. A homomorphism is a map between two structures that preserves the operations of the structures. It is easy to verify that the real numbers form a ring under normal addition and multiplication operations. We can define three polynomials whose evaluations are a, b, and c respectively. The addition of polynomials are commutative. When we evaluate both sides, we see that. The real numbers addition is also commutative. This is what homomorphism means. The operations on the structures are preserved under such a mapping. Another example: the addition associativity of polynomials corresponds to the addition associativity of real numbers. You can verify the requirements one by one. It seems we do have a homomorphism that maps the polynomial ring to the real number ring. But one and only one concern has to be addressed. Let's look at the multiplicative identity when evaluating at zero. So for any polynomial, p alpha multiplies the multiplicative identity is itself. Evaluating at x equals any number but zero, it's fine. But when evaluating at zero, zero to the power of zero must be one. Otherwise, we lose the multiplicative identity of real numbers. And you know, mathematicians can accept anything, but being ugly. In the most popular calculus textbook in the United States, zero to the power of zero is recognized as one of the so-called indeterminate forms. Along with many others, like zero over zero or infinity over infinity, these notations make me sad every time I see them. They are considered indeterminate only in the context of a limiting process. To me, that feels lazy and misleading. When we try to interpret them as they are, they have very different meanings. Unlike zero over zero, which is also very interesting, we have plenty of reasons to call zero to the power of zero one. Every notation or symbol we have has a historical background. The battle over the meaning behind the notation zero to the power zero has been there for over two hundred years. On the left-hand side, we have Tim Oler, who supports zero to the power of zero is one. On the right-hand side, we have Tim Koshy, 
who supports zero to the power zero is not one. We have two anonymous players on Team Koshi. They didn't have a name in history, but they made a significant impact on this battle. You have seen the first round of the battle already. It's just the argument we made at the beginning of the video. Simply manipulating the numbers with exponentiation rules, you can get different results fairly easily. Round 2. In 1821, Cauchy published the book, The Analysis Course, and in this book, we can see the indeterminate forms as we know today. Those notations in the context of calculus have been there for at least 200 years. Mobius jumped into the ring in 1834, and he claimed that x to the power of x when x goes to zero is one. He was right, and this is a good limit exercise. However, Mobius incorrectly generalized his result. The anonymous commenters provided examples like x to the power of a plus x over log x. And when x goes to zero, it is evaluated to e to the power of a. Obviously, it can be quite arbitrary. Since then, for more than 200 years, Team Koshi is a winning team. In Professor Knuth's own words, Cauchy had good reason to consider zero to the power of zero as an undefined limiting form, in the sense that the limiting value of fx to the power of gx is not known a priori when fx and gx approach zero independently. However, distinguishing the limiting form and the notation itself, Professor Knuth is clearly on team Euler. Let's find out who else are on those teams. Since C99, 0 to the power of 0 is 1. It is also 1 in Java, and without too much surprise, it is also 1 in Python. As of today, most programming languages adopted the convention that 0 to the power of 0 is 1. On the software side, the good old Excel says it's not a number, while its competitor Google Sheet says it is 1. If by any chance you created a spreadsheet that involves 0 to the power of 0, be careful. The savior of college students were from Alpha says 0 to the power of 0 is undefined, but it gives a link to the wiki page in determinate form. The good thing of war from Alpha is that it treats 0 to the power of 0 and 0, 0 0.0 to the power of 0, 0 0.0 differently, as it acknowledges that 0 to the power of 0 has a special meaning in the context of calculus. All right, our players are ready. Which team would you join? So, at the end of the day, what is 0 to the power of 0? The lazy answer is, it depends. However, treating this notation as it is, 0 to the power of 0, in the context of integer exponentiation, it has no well-defined meaning. However, in the context of mapping, combinatorics, polynomial manipulation, and ring homomorphism, it should be defined as 1. In the context of calculus, especially in our education, it is a convention to call it indeterminate, realizing it represents a limiting form. And this is probably the best we can do to settle this conflict for centuries.